Hi everyone and thank you for joining me in today's lecture. The topic we're going to be discussing today is quantitative research. So like last week we're beginning the lecture by providing a definition of quantitative research and going through its core features. Then we're going to focus on the concept of a research variable which is central to quantitative studies. In particular we will focus on being able to distinguish between independent and dependent variables and we will also discuss different levels or scales of variables. After that we are going to discuss quantitative research designs with a specific focus on experimentation and corpus linguistics. Then we will go through the differences between descriptive and inferential statistics. And then finally we'll go through some core strengths and weaknesses of quantitative research. Alright, let's dive in. So let's begin today's lecture by getting a general feel and understanding for quantitative research. And we start this by having a look at defining features of quantitative research. So, as we already know, quantitative research, along with qualitative research, are research families. And quantitative research is a type of research that focuses on quantifiable relationships between entities or phenomena. So here, think of it as a cause and effect type of relationship, or a if X occurs, then Y occurs, correlational relationship. So we're trying to assert that certain phenomena influence each other, or that if something occurs, something else is also going to occur. It is also the type of research that collects measurable numerical data. So these types of data will be presented as numbers, organized in tables, and visualized as figures and graphs, rather than presented only in words. And finally, quantitative research analyzes the data by statistical means. So today we are going to be distinguishing between descriptive and inferential statistics, with a particular focus on descriptive statistics. But as the semester progresses, we'll find out about other research methods associated with quantitative statistical analyses. Just like qualitative research, Quantitative research is employed in many different academic disciplines. It originated and was mostly used in the natural sciences, but then branched out into many other fields, including the social sciences, medicine, journalism, and of course, the humanities. If you look at linguistics and applied linguistics, quantitative methods are very frequently used, and they are particularly common to investigate language use in corpus linguistics, and cognitive processes associated with language. That particularly happens in psycholinguistics, language processing, and representation in the mind and brain kind of research. So let us look at the assumptions of quantitative research. The assumptions that quantitative research makes about reality are quite different from those of qualitative research. So instead of perceiving reality as being socially constructed and subjective, reality is considered to be empirical and observable and it is broken down into parts and these parts can be called observations or phenomena or variables so all these different terms relate to phen phenomena under investigation the important part is that variables can be identified separated from one another quantified and measured either directly or indirectly thus Quantitative research asserts that reality is single and objective, which means that we all share one reality and that it can be broken down into parts. And as we heard, those parts are referred to as variables. The variables therefore can be easily identified, separated from one another, quantified and measured. For example, to understand errors made by language learners, we need to collect data on all variables that may cause errors and then use statistical methods to see if and how strongly each independent variable or predictor affects the dependent variable or outcome. That is, in this case, the errors that are produced by language learners. A critical aspect of quantitative research is how to operationalize variables. Operationalization means how to measure or categorize or define variables. 
So think about the weather. You know, if you say the weather in Brisbane is great, then you need to think about what does this mean? How can you measure uh, nice weather or good weather? You could, for example, measure it in how many days uh, of the year there's sun in Brisbane, or how little uh, rain falls or things like that, or the average temperature. So you can operationalize or measure these concepts like weather, but also all other types of phenomena in different ways. And this means you have to operationalize concepts. So I would encourage you to reflect on this for a little bit. For instance, we can investigate a particular group of learners, for example, Chinese language learners, and look at how their error rates change with the number of years that they have been studying English. So in the tutorial that come after this lecture, we will talk about how to quantify different variables of phenomena. And I invite you to think about it beforehand a critical aspect of quantitative research is really how to operationalize variables. In terms of its nature, quantitative research represents a stark contrast to qualitative research. So instead of being subjective and focused on individual instances, quantitative research is focused on falsification or it's falsification oriented. This means that quantitative research aims to assess existing models and theories of reality by testing if they are wrong. What we try to do is we have a hypothesis, a statement or an answer to a problem, and then we want to test it. We want to falsify it. We want to basically try to see if it's false or not, right? And if we prove it to be false, then it's falsified. It can be rejected. But if we fail to falsify it, then it basically stands. Let's say we hypothesize that errors are produced at different rates depending on language background. So if someone has German, French, Chinese or Korean as their first language and their proficiency level. And that can be operationalized, for example, as years of training or as scores on a language proficiency test. We now want to test this hypothesis by counting errors in essays written by learners from different language backgrounds. And then basically control for the different proficiency levels to see whether there's an observable systematic difference between learners from different language backgrounds. This also means that the research that's conducted in quantitative studies is very specific. So it means that quantitative research has a specific, particular narrow question at its core. And what is even more interesting is that this research question remains consistent throughout the project. Of course, the researcher may take notes of additional observations but the idea is that those additional insights do not contribute or alter the research design. They merely serve as inspiration for future research to be undertaken. So quantitative research is said to be linear and focused in nature. The logic of quantitative research is deductive rather than inductive. This means that we start typically with the broader theory. Based on this theory, we define some testable hypotheses. And then we test this by gathering some observations or data. Then, during the analysis of these observations, we can either support or reject the hypothesis, depending on what we find in the data. And therefore, we can support or reject the theory. The data that is collected within the scope of quantitative research is said to be reliable and replicable, which means that other researchers that wish to conduct a similar study should be able to do so irrespective of the context that the study is conducted in. And finally, one of the key aims of quantitative research is to be predictable and generalizable. So it means that if we collect enough evidence, then we're able to extrapolate the results beyond what we're just currently investigating and make inferences about the broader population. So this is actually one of the key features of inferential statistics, that we want to make claims about the population based on the sample that we've analyzed. All right, so let me summarize the features of quantitative research. So quantitative research focuses on determining causes or correlations between social phenomena. Once again, what influences a particular phenomenon and what affects another phenomenon? Usually, those observations and causes are examined either in a controlled and manipulated environment, using, for example, experimentation in a lab or in a natural setting, based on corpus data, 
So for example, in the lab, and as a control and manipulation is exercised by the researcher, who in turn remain objective and detached from the data. So that means that the researcher is a designer and an administrator rather than a participant in the study. Corpus data could consist, on the other hand, of natural data. That would be transcriptions of dinner table conversations or telephone calls or essays written by our university students. But it can be all other sorts of machine-readable texts. The purpose of quantitative research is to predict, generalise and provide ideally a causal explanation for the phenomenon under investigation. The obtained data is analysed systematically and statistically and data is presented in a technical write-up and shown visually in graphs and figures. Finally, to conclude the section, let me go through some situations in which quantitative analysis are inevitable. So if your study has its main argument based on the counting of things, for example words or occurrences of something, by definition you will need to employ a quantitative approach to research. So if you're interested in investigating linguistic diversity in Australia, essentially your research question is how many different languages are spoken in Australia. So therefore, to answer your question, you would need to be able to present your data numerically. Studies that aim at proving that two or more groups of people are different would also employ quantitative research methods. So for instance, we could be interested in looking at whether women use tag questions such as in it or isn't it or aren't you more frequently than men. And lastly, any study aiming at showing that two variables are related in some way, or in statistical terms we would use the term correlated, these kind of questions would also be addressed using a quantitative design. So here we may investigate things like whether age and success and second language acquisition are correlated. And so an assumption that we could make here is that the younger someone starts acquiring a second language, the better the outcome will be. All right, let's turn to variables. So I've already used the term variables throughout the, of this lecture and also previous lectures. And I'm hoping that through the context you were able to understand what variables refers to or have an intuition of what they mean. Today, however, we're aiming to provide a more formalized definition of variables. So quantitative research is all about measurement. And so therefore, variables are units of observation that vary in our research and the ones that get measured or quantified. The opposite of a variable is a constant, just so you know. So variables to be investigated, in other words, those that we pay attention to in our particular study design, are determined by the research question that we study. So if we look at the effect of age on heritage language maintenance in immigration communities in Australia, we can determine that age and language maintenance are the two variables that are mentioned in this question. There is no indication, for example, of gender or literacy or any other variable. However, if we know that there might be an effect, or if we assume that there might be an effect, these variables should also be considered. So therefore, the participants in our study will be grouped and compared based on their age, but in this case, not based on their gender. And we will develop a tool that measures and quantifies the language maintenance and not their literary skills, unless literary skills matters. Your relevant variables are said to be beyond the scope of a particular study. However, they're not useless and they should be controlled for because otherwise they might influence the results, which is then called confounding. So all variables that could affect an outcome should be considered when you conduct a study. Let's turn to independent and dependent variables. One of the key distinctions that quantitative researchers make between variables is the difference between independent and dependent variables. Independent variables are also referred to as predictors or predictive variables, and it's useful to think of them as the cause in a particular relationship. Dependent variables are also referred to as outcome or result variables, and they are the effect in the relationship. So dependent variables 
represent the phenomenon under investigation and the independent variables are those factors that influence that phenomenon. The independent or predictive variables represent the external factors that influence the investigated outcome. These are the variables that are selected and systematically manipulated by the researcher to determine if or to what extent they influence the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the central variable that has been investigated and that is affected by the independent variables. The dependent variable is typically the thing that we're interested in. So if we are asking how age affects heritage language maintenance, then age acts as our independent or predictive variable and heritage language maintenance is something that we're going to be measuring or that we're interested in and is thus the dependent variable. If we are looking at how task difficulty affects test scores, the task difficulty is the independent variable and the test score is the dependent variable. It is entirely possible to have multiple independent and dependent variables. However, what this means is that our research design is going to be more complex and it will require more sophisticated statistical tools to be able to analyze our data properly. The expected relationships between independent and dependent variables is formulated through a hypothesis. And if you recall, this relationship can be formulated as either being directional or non-directional. And the distinction between variables has to do with different levels or scales of measurement. So let us now turn to different types of variables or variable scales. So we're going to start by discussing the categorical variables. So basically, these have to do with entities that are divided into distinct categories based on the label they're assigned. Here we can look at nominal, categorical and ordinal variables. Nominal variables are distinguished based on the label, but they have no particular order. So for instance, if we look at the nominal variables, we can distinguish between correct and incorrect, yes or no. Uh, so here we have an either or relationship in that type of variable. If we look at categorical variables, what this means is that there's a single variable, but it has more than two categories. So we can recruit participants uh, with their native language backgrounds being English, Japanese, Portuguese, etc. So once again, we distinguish between different groups based on the label that we've assigned to those groups, but not based on the order. So if I reclassify this variable into English versus all other languages, then this would become a nominal variable again. Ordinal variables have an assumption that we have a label and a certain order to these variables. So for instance, we can group students based on their scores, so they can get a passing, a credit and a distinction grade. Here the assumption is that passing is not as good as credit and credit is not as good as distinction. So here, even though we can determine an order of variables, the interval between those variables does not have to be the same. So for instance, if we're using a scale of satisfaction of a particular course, the gap between highly satisfied and satisfied might be perceived as being closer than the difference between satisfied and neutral. Okay, so now we're moving on to discuss continuous or numeric variables. Numeric variables refer to entities that have a distinct score or numeric value. And here we can distinguish between interval and ratio scaled variables. So interval scaled variables are represented by things such as thermometers. So here we have values that are ordered, but unlike the ordinal variables, we have the same intervals between each point on that continuum. So the distance between 1 degree Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius is the same as the one between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius. So here are two limitations when we discuss interval uh, scale data or variables. The first is that zero is used arbitrarily. So when we say that it's zero degrees outside, it doesn't mean that there's no temperature. It doesn't mean that the quality of temperature is absent. It just means 
that we've assigned an arbitrary number to zero to present that it's really cold outside or that water starts to freeze. And then the second limitation is, because there is no zero, we cannot make mathematical conclusions about the relationship between different points on those scales. So for instance, we cannot say 40 degrees above zero is twice as hot as 20 degrees above zero. It's definitely hotter, but we cannot say that that relationship is exact. At least this is true for Celsius. And finally, we have ratio scaled variables. Ratio scaled variables have order, the same intervals between points, and no limitations, so they have a true zero. So here we talk about things such as height, weight, or in linguistic studies, sometimes reaction times. So here zero means an absence of something. So if somebody has shown zero milliseconds in the reaction time to a particular stimulus, it means that there is no reaction. Or if someone is zero centimeters tall, that means the person hasn't any height, which is in this case not really a good example. And we can also make inferences about mathematical relationships between different points of ratio scales. So for example, 20 milliseconds are twice as long as 10 milliseconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to some videos on YouTube and that explain different types of levels of variables. And hopefully uh, the more you get familiar with them, the clearer it becomes. Let's talk a little bit about research designs. So we already know that a variety of research procedures can be employed for quantitative research designs, such as interviews, questionnaires, experiments, and corpus linguistics. Today, we're going to focus on experimentation and corpus linguistics, which are really fundamental when it comes to quantitative research because their quantitative research is really prominent and dominant. So experiments are research procedures that are very controlled and where we manipulate only a single independent variable to then see how that affects the dependent variable, while all other variables are controlled for and remain constant. Also, we have the option to test the same subjects or participants at different points in time. So there we would measure them in a pre and post test setting. So that means, for example, that we test their vocabulary size at one point, then have an intervention and then again assess their vocabulary size. And then we can basically check if we have a control group where we have measurements at the same points in time if the manipulation, in that case, for example, we could test different types of training, has an effect, and if the test groups perform better than the control group. So the control group is kind of the baseline or expected performance if the uh, training would not have any effect. And the test groups are compared to the results of the control group. And those groups that are undergoing some treatment are typically referred to as the treatment or test group. The experimental setting should reflect the natural environment. So ideally procedures that are used in experimental research are representative of what participants are going through in real life. So in the language studies, those procedures would need to have to do with the production or perception of language. However, Laboratory settings are typically kind of artificial, so they can only aim to be natural, but oftentimes they are more or less artificial because they're in a strange setting or basically you don't feel as free and unobserved as you would in a normal setting. However, this artificial environment allows for precise investigation of variables. So it allows us to zero in on a subset of variables, but at the same time it creates, as we said, a not quite natural environment. So one final point I'd like to make in this section is on the distinction between true experimentation or simply experimentation and quasi-experimentation. This distinction has to do with participant sampling or participant recruitment. In experiments, participants are randomly drawn from a wider population and also randomly assigned to control and test group. For instance, to test the efficacy 
of a new social cultural awareness training, we may want to recruit a sample of 50 participants who work in multicultural environments and randomly assign them to two groups. One group, the control group, which does not receive any training, and a test group, which receives training. At the end of our experiment, we would measure the group's level of awareness and draw conclusions if the training works based on the observed differences. In quasi-experiments, we have pre-existing participant samples, and they may be tested without random selection or assignment to groups. So, for example, if we have the same aim of testing the efficacy of a new socio-cultural awareness training program, we can measure the level of awareness of the teaching staff at the School of Languages and Cultures in our school, and then administer the training, measuring the level of awareness again after the treatment, and then draw our conclusion based on the observed differences. So quasi-experimentation is often more practical and reasonable compared to true experimentation because sometimes we're interested in the performance of a particular sample. However, in that case we cannot really draw conclusions about causality, which means we can't really say if the observed differences are really only due to the treatment that the group has undergone. So experiments are actually more powerful, but they're also more difficult to implement. Let's talk about corpora. Another very common method in quantitative studies is the use of corpus data. One corpus, plural corpora, are digital speech samples. They can consist out of transcripts of conversations, essays, news articles, blog posts, etc. The only condition is that it's a large sample and that that sample consists out of machine-readable texts. Corpora aim to provide natural language samples that should reflect either distinct genres or text types. Then we're speaking of specialized corpora. That could be, for example, essays by English learners with Chinese first languages. Or corpora can reflect entire languages. In that case, we speak of the monitor corpus, which typically contain many different text types in one language. Or there are historical corpora that can be used to analyze the historical development of a language. For example, that could be letters written in English between 1100 and 1900 BC. What makes corpora ideal for quantitative analyses is that corpora provide frequency information about language use and often also provide information about the speakers or writers. Basic questions that can be easily answered using corpora are, for example, how often is a phrase used? In which context is a word used? How is a word used in American English versus British English? How often is one word used together with other words? such as Merry and Christmas. In that case, Merry and Christmas, which are occurring more often together than we would expect by chance, are referred to as collocations. So words that co-occur more than you would expect by chance form collocations. Now let's talk about descriptive and inferential statistics. Since quantitative findings are represented numerically, it is important to understand what kind of numeric values we're interested in. Descriptive statistics have the purpose of organizing, displaying and summarizing data. So here data can be summarized in terms of frequencies or percentages, or in terms of means and median values, which are measures of centrality. Also, what you oftentimes see are measures of variability, such as the standard deviation, dispersion, variance, or range. In terms of visualization, descriptive statistics often come with histograms, box plots, or line charts. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, have the purpose of testing hypotheses and making generalizations about the population based on the sample that we've analyzed. So statistical tests that you might already have heard about or that you're familiar with, such as t-tests, chi-square tests, regression analysis or ANOVAs, are typical types of inferential statistics because they are used to analyze features in the sample and then draw conclusions about the population based on these samples. We'll actually talk more about inferential statistics later in this course.
The results of such tests are reported in tables and in the form of statistical parameters with values for effect sizes and significance. The results of inferential statistics are often visualized in effect size plots. However, today we are going to focus specifically on descriptive statistics. So within the scope of descriptive statistics, we can describe the mean or an average of a particular group. And this measure is useful for continuous variables. So for example, we could use the mean to describe the English proficiency level of our international students, or for example, an average exam score. The median value is quite similar to the mean value. However, it doesn't represent the average, but the middle value. It is also useful for continuous variables, especially when the data has outliers or extreme values that skew the mean value to a certain extent. So for example, here we could look at house prices in Brisbane, or salaries, or exam scores if a couple of students receive really outstanding high grades or very poor grades, while everyone else received grades that are closer to the average. So by looking at the median, we're trying to mitigate the influence of outliers. We can also look at the range, which represents the lowest and the highest values within a sample. Once again, it is useful for continuous variables, but instead of indicating the center, it rather re represents the spread or variability. And finally, we can also look at the mode, or the value that occurs most frequently within our sample. And that is useful for categorical variables. So for instance, we can look at different students' native language backgrounds, and then the language background that occurs most would be the mode. In this week's tutorial, we'll be practicing producing descriptive statistics for a specific data set. Now, just like in qualitative research, Quantitative studies also have their strengths and weaknesses, which means that in some situations they are more applicable than in others. So let's begin with discussing the positives of quantitative research. So first of all, quantitative research is going to be especially fruitful for addressing specific questions about relatively well-fined phenomena. So then a quantitative is going to be better for studies that focus on specific phenomena and where you can easily identify the variables and the variable levels. Furthermore, quantitative research uses deductive logic, which means that it is more easily perceived of or viewed as real science, which essentially means that it's closer to natural sciences and that is methodologically more rigorous. Also, it provides stronger empirical evidence, which is grounded in numbers and statistical inferences rather than in intuition or sub subjective judgments. Finally, the fact that quantitative research is objective and generalizable means that provided the experiment or the study was well designed and that a sufficiently large number of observations was collected, we can reliably draw inferences about the wider population based on our particular sample and based on our study. We can also make accurate predictions about the general phenomenon and also offer informed recommendations to promote change and improvements for procedures or actions and ways how to do stuff. So quantitative analyses really depend on high quality data in which variables are measured well. So essentially it means that they are well controlled and that the values of the variables accurately represent what they're supposed to measure. This, of course, can be quite challenging, especially when you're researching complicated or understanding areas where the variables are difficult to operationalize. Such areas include things like culture, identity, attitude, and motivation, because they're intrinsically subjective. However, also in these cases, you can actually think about operationalizations that make these concepts measurable. One criticism of quantitative research is that it is somewhat artificial, somewhat narrow in focus because it really focuses on specific, narrowly defined questions. And also a problem is that you really need good data. If the data quality is not good, then your inferences will also be not optimal. Finally, we can say that employing statistical methods for analysis is usually perceived of as being more difficult because you need training to perform statistics properly. 
quantitative research really requires a different type of data and training compared to qualitative and more interpretative analyses. Let's summarize the key points of today's lecture. So let's consolidate what we've discussed today. Quantitative research aims to test specific hypotheses to see if a certain explanation aligns with the reality that we can observe. And they aim to quantify relationships between phenomena. But they can also be used to explore data, which we haven't talked about in this lecture. The testing of hypotheses and models is performed by examining the relationships between predetermined variables. The predictive variables are referred to as independent variables and the outcome variables or outcome variable is referred to as a dependent variable. Only experimental settings or experimental designs can be used to determine causality, which means that something causes something else. All other types of designs, including quasi-experiments, can only determine correlation, which means that there is a relationship between variables, but we do not know if the relationship is causal. Also, the stance that researchers take in quantitative analyses is the stance of an observer. So the researcher typically does not get immersed in the situation, which reduces uh, researcher bias. Quantitative research as such aims to establish a general understanding of behaviors and phenomena across various settings and contexts. So quantitative studies aim to make predictions and provide us with an understanding of the empirical reality we live in. Quantitative research also should aim to be replicable in the sense that by describing your research procedure, others should be able to repeat what you've done and get to the same results. That also speaks to the aim of quantitative research to be generalizable, which is one of the key strengths of the quantitative approach. However, the quantitative approach may be difficult to implement when analyzing abstract or very broad type of phenomena. That's why it's a good idea to really think about what method is best suited to address your research question. That's it for today's lecture. I hope you had fun and you learned something about quantitative research. Thank you so much for listening and see you next week. Bye bye.